capitalism that focus on financial benefits. But there is so much more value than just financial value. There's true value, which includes the environment, which includes the social side. And I think we really need to rethink what we see as valuable. Hi there. Welcome to the Circum Center, a series of stimulating dialogues on the circular economy. Today's topic is the ecosystem enablers for circularity. A successful systemic change requires a holistic approach by including all ecosystem actors, such as non-governmental organizations, startups, businesses, governments, and the people. Ecosystem enablers are the essential force bridging, activating, and catalyzing these actors. Unfortunately, our world is only 9% circular, which means we toss away 91% of our resources. That is a horrific number and we need ecosystem enablers to merge everyone's support to change it. Meet Maike Ahmed Dahman, the co-founder of Excess Materials Exchange and the director of circular economy at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. WBCSD helps globally over 200 companies accelerate their transition to become more sustainable. Let's hear it from Maike. How these ecosystem enablers play a substantial role in empowering the shift to a circular future. Hi, Maike. Welcome to the Circum Center. We're going to start with the first circle, which is going to focus on your personal life and background. Let me start with this question. What inspired your interest in the circular economy in your life? Thank you for asking and thank you for having me. So I think my interest in circular economy or sustainability was always there. It's not something that just popped up. It, it's, it was a given and it was there for as long as I can remember. So when I was very little, I was always interested in the environment, how people dealt with the environment, um, how we interacted, how we treated it and how we could treat it better. Because as a kid, especially, there was a lot of information about the coral reefs dying already and the hole in the ozone layer was a really big thing when I was younger. Uh, the dumping of nuclear waste in the oceans was still a thing at the time. And uh, I just really wanted to do something with it. So I started studying culture and ecology and political science just to understand why people do the things that they do. And within those studies, I've always had a focus on at the time called environment. When you think about your past, what was the most important event in your life that made you who you are today? I think that it was uh, when I was around 17, 18, I got elected as a United Nations youth delegate. So then you're officially a part of the country's uh, delegation and you represent, I represented youth and children in UN conferences around sustainability. And I think why it was so influential is because before that, I wasn't really aware and I didn't really know I could have an impact. Like I, me personally, this small individual amongst so many could influence anything. I didn't understand it. And I think by being elected and being part of that and noticing that my voice got heard and picked up, and I was speaking in these UN conferences and there were ministers listening to what we were saying and then and then reflected back in, in official text, I think that is when I first understood that speaking up actually makes a difference and can make a difference. And, and that really empowered me to go forward and keep speaking up for what I believe in. My next question is, you are selected as one of the Innovators Under 35 Europe 2018 by MIT Technology Review. Which crossroads in your life led you to this success? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, a lot of crossroads, actually. Uh, it was one thing that led to another. So as I said, I've always been interested in the environment and seeing how we as humans could better work together instead of just depleting or polluting the environment. And also how we can enable human well-being. And I was working at the time on something that's called x which is a tax shift from taxing labor to taxing resources. And with that, you create completely different incentives in society where if you tax resources, you start using them less. If you tax labor less, you can start using it more. So we create this frame where we really lift people up and at the same time are very careful about the environment. So then I had to 
start thinking about how can we actually start taxing resources? Like what resources are there going through society? I had no idea. So I thought, okay, I'll just Google, let's see. And then I found out we don't really know. We don't really know what's in our products. We don't really know what exactly is in our phones, in our cars, in our clothing, where it comes from. So that is what led me to invent something that's called a resources passport, which is basically an ingredient list of, of what's in a product and which materials are in there, where they come from. And that led me to, to one, win some awards, to be selected for other things. That's how I ended up with my own company as well. So it, there's many crossroads that lead me to where I am today. Thank you for your answers. And this is the end of our first circle. And now we're moving into the second circle, which focuses on the industry and the discipline that you're working on. My first question is, you are the founder of a circular economy startup, Excess Materials Exchange, which you define as a dating site for materials. How does EME contribute to the circular economy? So what we see in a circular economy, what you want is that regenerative by design and not by coincidence, and that materials and products can keep on existing in loops, endless. But in order to do that, we need to recycle them, reuse them, make them into this new loop. And that is really hard because you need transparency of information for that. You need to know where it is, what the quality is, what the quantity is. Um, and all this information isn't really publicly available. So what we did with Excess Materials Exchange is actually help companies get this information to identify this material. Then we added intelligence so you could find it. And in the end, we integrated it so that we didn't necessarily keep one material in the same loop, but could find new destinations. What is the role of startups in facilitating the circular economy? That's a good question as well. I think the role of startups is really that they can change really fast and innovate very fast. And so they come up with new ideas. They are not stuck in a gigantic organization with lots of uh, shareholders that you need to report to. They can, they can try, they can implement, they can pivot, they can adjust, they can try it again. And that new way of thinking is very relevant for implementing this because it's a completely new way of working. It's a paradigm shift. And just going about it with the old ways, we're not going to be able to do that. So we need this creative thinking to make that difference. And I think startups are really one of the main catalyzers for this. What is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development doing to enable a circular economy in the world? So, as I said, we focus on the how-to question, and that is central in the work that we do. And then with that, we have five different things that we focus on. Standard setting, tool development, advocacy, coalition building, or we focus on knowledge and spreading the knowledge. And that is all the work that we do. So it could be that in the transition, people are really craving for a piece of information. How do we measure circularity equally every company in the world? That's a standard setting question that we work on. So there's, there's different angles that we go about it. Which project of WBCSD made the most significant impact in enabling the circular economy? The main project within WBCSD that has an impact on enabling circular economy is uh, what we call the Circular Transition Indicators, or CTI. So it's a way to measure circularity, and it's developed by business for business. And it's at this point in time the most used measurement method worldwide by big organizations, but also by SMEs to measure how circular they actually are. Their product, their business unit, and you can aggregate it for your company. And the reason that that is so important is because when you can measure it, you can also start changing it. And this really flags the issues where circularity is relevant in your organization and how to move forward from that. So we did a case study with uh, Microsoft, looked at some of their equipment, and they saw that they could really 
up their circularity score by changing things in the design or changing things in the packaging. And knowing that from measuring that with CTI really enabled them to take the next step and say like, oh, but if we, for example, instead of gluing something together, we screw it together, we can also take it apart easily afterwards. And we have two still functioning components that we can use again. I think another one is really looking at what technologies do we have to scale up the solutions that we have to really reduce, for example, carbon emissions in the environment or pollution in the oceans. What are the ongoing projects at WBCST about the circular economy? So we have various projects and the circular transition indicators is, is one of our flagship projects. Then we have a big project around plastics and packaging material, where we really focus on how can companies report and disclose on their plastic use and also help shape up the UN treaty around marine litter and plastic pollution that just got kicked off beginning of March and make sure that it's really ready to be implemented uh, when it's finalized the end of 2024. Then we have a project around the digital product passport. So the European Union makes it mandatory, not really specified when, but soon, uh, for at least electronics, textiles and the built environment for every new product that comes on the EU market to have a digital product passport. So it needs to have information about like starting with the chemicals, starting from the mine. Um, and that is something that has never been done before for a real like product to have all this information there to be shared by different players in the value chain. So how can we make sure that we deal with this to make sure that we can decarbonize our economy? We're talking about ecosystem enablers and probably governments are the biggest ecosystem enablers in the world. And what do you think is their role in supporting and empowering the circular economy? So I think their role is one to uh, unlock finance to help stimulate it. So not uh, give subsidies to like non-sustainable or non-circular initiatives. And on the other hand, the circular economy is new. So we really need to either create new policy or uh, adjust existing policies to really enable that. So an example is that you have product legislation and you have waste legislation and there's nothing really in between. So if you then have a product that you want to get rid of, it's called waste. But if you can still use it or use part of it, you can because it's in waste legislation and you need to get it back in product legislation, which is extremely difficult. And there's nothing really in between that's being developed, like extended use, for example. So there's lots of new concepts that need to be invented and implemented. And that is a, a really big role for policymakers to do that. And besides that, I think a really important role is to make sure that whatever they're stimulating is well thought through. So one of the things that we see happening is that they stimulate uh, recycling by setting recycling quota. By itself, you think that's a really good idea. A and it is great that you stimulate recycling. However, by setting a quota on recycling and not on reuse, people skip the reuse and just make sure that it's recycled. But then the reuse part is the part that comes before that and it, it just gets ignored. So policymakers have a really influential role to make sure that it, actually can lift off. How do you decide more holistically which projects to run at the WBCSD? That's a good question. I think, well, we decide upon which projects we execute together with the members that we have. And I think in general, we have a lack of holistic decision-making tools. So we either focus on carbon emission reduction, but then we forget that if we make decisions based upon that, they might have really detrimental impact on biodiversity. But that was a different tool, so that wasn't taken into account. So I think you touch upon a good point that we still operate in silos. So reducing one doesn't necessarily mean reducing the impact on another area, and we lack really the the tools to measure that correctly and for companies to be able to really assess okay this is the best holistic option so i think in general we don't really have the tool i think starting to measure with cti for example is a first start um but really having a, a global tool for that would be very helpful Thank you for your answers in the second circle of our conversation in which we looked at the center of the industry. 
Now we're gonna move into the third circle. My first question is, how can governments, businesses, and the civil society best collaborate to build a circular future? Well, there's, there's many ways that they can collaborate. I think, first of all, understanding that they need one another is helpful. And I think in general, individuals understand that they need one another, but the institutions or the setup of the institutions behind it don't always make it easy to really collaborate. And I have that experience having a startup, like the time cycle in which a startup operates is completely different from which a big corporate operates. So those don't necessarily immediately align and it's not because they don't want to co cooperate. It just makes it more difficult to co cooperate. And it's the same holds true for governments and business and, and civil society and, and non-governmental organizations. So being aware of that and creating for our platforms like WBCC, but also web, there, there's many platforms out there to really facilitate this, this collaboration, regardless of the topic, I think is extremely important and making sure that whatever is being done is available for others to use and to scale um, so they don't have to reinvent the wheel themselves. What can the business leaders change in their decision-making to embrace circularity in their businesses? I mean, there's many things, but right now what is really hard is that business decisions are usually financial decisions. And we are just looking at financial decisions. Whereas if we transition to a more sustainable or circular economy, we need to include social and, and nature or environmental decisions there as well. So it needs to be reflected in whatever we measure, whatever value we attribute to something. So we really need to rethink capitalism and rethink what businesses are for in order to really shift the mindset of people and, and lift up circularity. As a professional with years of experience in this field, what would you first advise brands and businesses who want to transform towards a circular economy? I would advise them to start using CTI actually, <laughs> to do an assessment like where you're at. Um, it's difficult. Where are you struggling? What is going on in your supply chain? And what do you have? Like now, if you don't write down what you have, it's written off the books because it's seen as waste and it's gone. Whereas if you write it down, you can actually still get value from it financially, but also environmentally and socially by keeping it in the loop. So my suggestion is start writing it down and use CTI to see where you can actually make impact and then build a strategy around that to move forward. Thank you, Maike, for this informative conversation. I learned a lot today. It was a pleasure hosting you. Thank you so much for the conversation and thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching. We hope this conversation inspired you to start your circularity journey today. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell button not to miss the future dialogues with passionate leaders in the circular economy. If you enjoyed this conversation, you could listen to the whole interview on Spotify or Apple Podcasts from the link below. See you at the next Circumcenter episode, discovering the center of your decisions.